Hello. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, my name is Bridget Kerr. I'm a computer simulation and gaming student at the University of Tulsa in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And uh, the project that I'm getting to work on is with uh, university faculty, PhD students, master's students, and other undergraduate students. So first things first, the project is funded by the US Army Engineer uh, Research and Development Center. And um, the, what I'm showing you today are my findings and opinions and not necessarily uh, reflect the views of the funder. I'm required to say that. Uh, so digital twins. The definition of a digital twin really varies depending on the source that you're looking at, but in general, uh, it's a digital representation of a physical object, system, or process that is updated in real time with its physical counterpart. So you have your physical asset, your digital twin, and a lot of data going back and forth in between. Um, these were uh, originally used to, uh, uh, to increase productivity in the manufacturing industry around 2002, but now uh, they're being used across many disciplines. Uh, for example, uh, like in healthcare, um, digital twin, uh, use, emerging technology is using digital twins to create virtual emulations of, uh, of physical, uh, of human tissues, organs, and cells that adapt to fluctuations in data and uh, forecast the future trajectory of the physical patient. Uh, also in aerospace, digital twins are used to uh, kind of assess mission possibilities and facilitate astronaut training. Uh, but let's talk about the project that I get to work on. Like I said, the University of Tulsa is collaborating with the U.S. Army um, Engineer Research and Development Center uh, in the development of a virtual immersive remote sensing and actuation system. So the system centers around digital entities that are interconnected and represented in virtual reality. And we have four buildings across the university that are being included in the project. Uh, the, the project has five teams uh, that are working in tandem. We're kind of all developing this system on our own and making it work uh, together. At the same time, uh, it has Knowledge Core, which is the hub of the data flow. It has sensors and networks mobile robotics, cybersecurity, and virtual reality. Now, the process of developing the Versa system uh, includes the creation of a digital model, of course, uh, of each installation uh, and replicating its main physical uh, structures and the objects within it. So when I joined the project in uh, May of uh, this year, uh, the, virtual, the VR team had purchased a high-end scanner and were kind of like exploring what kind of scans they could get with it. And I was tasked with finding alternate methods of creating models. Um, and I'm a pretty visual person, so I wanted to know what, what does this look like? What, what does something like this look like already? What are the standards? Uh, so let's think about this room. If we were gonna come in and model this room, I wanted to know, can we use simple geometric shapes for uh, for representations, can we finally find a use for that cube that Blender has? You know, can a cube be that chair and maybe a longer one and wider one for the table? Uh, or should I be able to tell the difference between this chair and one upstairs? Or can it be somewhere in between? Like, can this chair represent any chair as long as the dimensions are correct? Um, unfortunately, there are not really real world examples to pull from. Um, I wanted to see a visual side by side of a physical entity and the digital entity. And even in academic literature, those are lacking. So we had to determine the most important features for our project. Um, and uh, to be clear, as a whole, this project's fairly exploratory. We're trying to figure out uh, how we can push the boundaries of what's been done before. Um, a lot of this is a very data-heavy uh, project. Uh, and obviously, the, the VR team is only dealing with kind of one side of that and, and the flow that we have to, to manipulate. But um, let's consider this room again. Um, if we're modeling it or if we're scanning it and then modeling it, if the next group that comes in here changes it and they want a dance floor in the middle and I don't know, table, tables around the edge and a disco ball, we don't wanna have to rescan 
and spend all of that time rescanning and rebuilding our model. So we want uh, models that have uh, the ability to have objects move around and be replaced. Um, another thing that um, is important is that we have these mobile robotic units um, that are moving through our space and interacting with things like this. Uh, we have three of these Boston Dynamic dogs and they can pick up items and they can open doors and interact with things. So we need to make sure that the fidelity of those objects that they're interacting with uh, makes sense when it's visualized in virtual reality. Um, so ideally you'd have all these really beautiful high poly models, but we're processing this on standalone VR, means the, the headset's processing this. So we need to keep processing to a minimum, which means we're gonna work with as low poly models as we can, um, while making sure that the fidelity of those certain uh, key components that the dogs will be interacting with is high enough that, that it makes sense when it's visualized. So one of the first things we tried was uh, taking a CAD file from one of our buildings. And if you don't know what a CAD file is, it's, a, it's a, like a digital building planning file. It has tons of information in it. Um, but we built this room uh, based on that CAD file and it looked pretty good. We used the textures from images taken from the space. Uh, the problem with this is that when you build a building, it's not always constructed the way that it's planned. Maybe this room is, this wall over here is like two inches farther out or the angle of the, where those walls meet is not quite right, which means you have to go back and measure everything to make sure that you're getting accuracy in your model, <clears throat> which is really time consuming and uh, prone to error. So uh, additionally, lots of older buildings, which uh, we don't have as many in the US as you guys do here, but they don't have CAD files. Um, so another uh, thing that we explored was, well, maybe then we get a floor plan of the actual space. So we, we looked at a bunch of different software that would take uh, photogrammetry or LIDAR scans. Photogrammetry, if you saw the presentation yesterday, it was great. Uh, it's a lot of overlapping images uh, that, that give you, you can build 2D or 3D models from them. They get, give you a lot of visual information. Or uh, LiDAR scanning, which has um, laser pulses that the reflection gives you distance information. Um, and so we tried all these different softwares but couldn't really get anything that was consistent. So I'd scan this room and I'd get three different floor plans. Um, each, you know, something different, e different each time. Um, and they also, they're just inaccurate, um, uh, inches inaccurate, which was not really what we were going for in our project. Um, there was, we also came across a, a GitHub uh, repository that had a project in it to take a floor plan and create a 3D model in Blender from it, uh, but it also didn't quite produce the uh, results that we need for this project. So continued development on our Versa system led to two main workflows uh, that would produce models that we could actually work with. Uh, that's outsourcing from a company that I'll just call the company uh, from here on out. While the second is modeling in-house using Blender. I just wanna make a note real quick that our university uh, for the simulation and gaming degree path um, requires two uh, 3D modeling classes. And starting in spring of this year, they started teaching those in Blender which is really cool. Um, so in both processes, we start with scanning the space, and that could be photogrammetry or LIDAR. Um, and we do it, we try to, using the company's high-end LIDAR scanner that we purchased for the project, as well as an iPad Pro 11, uh, which has LIDAR capabilities. So let's talk about outsourcing. Uh, when uh, we were first trying to figure out how to how to make these models, people came to us and said, hey, I've, I've seen you know, amazing things on uh, realty websites. You know, I, I can walk through this home that I'm thinking about buying. Um, can't you do something like that? It looks great. And, and it does look great, but these are just stitched together, stitched together photographs, uh, which means that anytime something in the space changed, you'd have to rescan, and also there's no interactivity in it. You can't move objects around. Um, so those were not gonna be workable for us. Uh, but as far as the outsourcing company, you make your scan, you upload it to their cloud uh, service, and then there are a variety of packages you can purchase, 
which range from floor plans to complete mechanical electrical plumbing system uh, models. So we purchased and tested several of these uh, some, several of these packages, and most of them ended up giving us single mesh models, so the whole space is one connected mesh, uh, which doesn't work for us. Uh, but also, you want to go in and try and separate the objects out of that mesh and clean that up. That's, uh, that's from a point cloud. Can you imagine? That's, those are, that's with all the vertices there selected. It's, it's a nightmare. Um, you don't, it's just completely inefficient for editing, uh, for rendering. So those were not uh, paths we wanted to follow. They, uh, the company also offers uh, a BIM file option that you can purchase. Uh, if you don't know what a BIM file is, it's a building information model. And kind of similar to a CAD file, it has all the information you could need for your building, but it, uh, it, like geometry, materials, things like that. But it also has a hierarchy of objects and kind of tracks what kind of objects. You tag your objects in certain ways and, and create this hierarchy uh, of what's in your model which is really cool, but we don't need that. Our project does not require BIM hierarchy, but it does re result in objects that are separate meshes, which means we can move them around and it will work for our project. So the only problem here is, as you can see, there are a bunch of different tiers that have different objects included in them. Um, the problem is when you look at this, you don't really know what you're gonna get. Online, of course, you can see, I'm gonna get these type of files. This is, the, this is the general idea of what I'm gonna get, but you don't know what that model's gonna look like. You don't know if there's something in there that's gonna be omitted, because it doesn't strictly fall into furniture or uh, MEP systems. So one thing that we have a problem with is uh, we have a whole sensor team. They're putting a wide array of sensors all throughout our buildings and we need to know the location of each one of those sensors. So we need to be able to visualize them in virtual reality, so they need to be included in our project. And um, it's just not clear whether you're gonna get that or not. So what we did is we purchased, um, sorry, we purchased the second tier BIM file, and, um, and this, is, this is it. Uh, for one of our spaces. And uh, for in-house modeling, we decided to compare, I'm sorry, I'm going backwards. For in-house, we decided to compare, because that purchase package was expensive, um, so we decided to compare what we could do in-house with it. So we took that same, that same room and modeled it according to what the the BIM tier package included, so we included the same objects that they included. Um, yeah, and our process is, is scanning the space and importing that, those scans into reality capture and then creating a single mesh model, which I said wouldn't work, but we import that model into Blender and then we use it as a spatial reference for building in Blender. Um, so you're just really building inside, I tried to show, you're really building inside um, that messy, it's a little bit messy, but you still get a lot of spatial information in there. So we're just building those models inside of that single mesh model. Um, for us, the modelers that we have on the project, we're using Blender's native tools. Um, however, there are a couple of add-ons I do wanna mention because I think they're really cool. Uh, CAD Sketcher and Blender BIM give uh, Blender CAD and BIM tool capabilities so that if that is a workflow that you are used to working in, um, you can do it in Blender. Uh, however, it was not the most efficient way for us to create our models. So uh, one of the most important differences to note between outsourcing and in-house is uh, the precision of certain key features. Like uh, in our buildings, we have many different kinds of door handles. It seems like a silly thing, but um, you know the difference between pushing and pulling or using a lever or having a keypad lock or a card scanner, those are important when you have mobile robots interacting in that space. And as you can see here, uh, 
The outsourced model came with some generic handles on the doors. And in another door, there, you know, there was one that doesn't have a handle, and they put handles on everything, um, versus in-house, which you, know, you can model to the correct fidelity that will show the interaction well. So let's talk about time and cost. Um, the time it took for the uh, model to come back after we purchased it from the, house, from the company uh, was three days. And the time it took us to model it in-house uh, with one of our student modelers uh, was eight hours. Um, the prices you see here are US dollars per square foot. We took the, um, the estimated cost of that room, that 420 square foot room, cost us $420. And we took the estimates for the other tiers uh, and calculated what those would have cost us uh, based on the accuracy of their estimate versus the price we, uh, we paid. For in-house, we are using student modelers, so there's not really a, I don't know, we tried to find a relative uh, money comparison. So for uh, the median hourly wage for a 3D modeler in the US is $27 an hour, so that's what we use, even though the efficiency of our student modelers is not gonna be the same and probably the quality as uh, somebody who's been working in this field for a few years. Uh, and that's how we got our pricing. And as you can see, there's a significant difference. Uh, it's a lot cheaper to model in-house. This does not take into account that the company has a uh, subscription fee that is a monthly payment based on how many users you have on, on the account and how many active spaces you have. Um, it also doesn't take into account the fact that when we receive these models, we still have to go back into them and add in anything that was left out or edit things to the proper fidelity uh, for those interactions. Also, I do wanna note that moving forward with in-house modeling, we will begin to build up kind of a library of objects that we can use, both as generic objects, when, when it doesn't matter if that chair is, looks like that chair or not, um, but then we can also use items that are heavily repeated in a space, doors, windows, tables and chairs, uh, that need to be, have, that, have that higher fidelity. We can reuse those in the space and eventually over the course of subsequent modeling, um, we'll build up this library and, and greatly increase our efficiency. So some considerations. The total square feet in our project was 73,305 square feet. I don't know if that seems like a lot to you. It seems like a lot to me, but um, if we took the fourth tier BIM package, which would include um, architecture, furniture, uh, and then mechanical and electrical, just the fixtures, not the whole system, so you know, outlets and things like that, uh, to potentially be able to include our sensors in there, it would cost us $118,754 for outsourcing versus $49,916 in-house. Like I said before, that doesn't, the outsourcing doesn't account for having to go back and spend time modeling uh, to bring it up to fidelity. So the, another big difference is for the companies, they, they estimated 35 days to return a project like this to us uh, versus what it would take us, uh, based on that eight hour model creation, it would take us 1,745 uh, hours to model this in-house, which is roughly 42 and a half weeks of one modeler modeling 40 hours a week, uh, which is not a good time return. Um, so another thing to consider is the availability of modelers. So in our project, we have students who um, are taking time out of their studies to work on this project and, and model for us. But uh, other companies may not have modelers available and you have to take into consideration how many modelers it would take to, that you'd have to be able to find to, to complete this project in the time frame that you need. Uh, one thing we didn't actually calculate was what it would cost to um, combine both outsourcing and in-house like I've talked about. Uh, if we did that, we would probably purchase the second tier BIM package, which was architecture and furniture. And then we would add to it um, with in-house modeling. The, the tier two would cost us about $73,000. 
and it's hard to say what, how much modeling we'd have to do on top of that. So I'm actually at time, so I'm just gonna kind of say one last thing. That um, over the last couple days, seeing all the ways, it's just been incredible seeing the ways that people are using Blender. And as a new Blender user, um, seeing the continued development of Blender in general, not to mention the incredible add-ons, uh, and, and how they extend Blender's reliability as a tool across different dif disciplines, uh, it's kind of mind-blowing, uh, especially for somebody who just, I'm just getting into this. Um, and our project is a little bit different in that we're just using Blender in the most basic way. But the relevant point is that even using Blender in this most basic way, we're able to, to use it to increase the efficiency of our workflow in this extremely complex system that we're developing uh, in the Versa system. So I just wanna say thank you to Blender and thank you all for being here today. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, I would be very happy to talk to you afterwards. Thank you.